Welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Today, I've got an interview for you guys with Matt Robinson from Southwest Research Institute. And we are talking about ROS, the robot operating system, and specifically ROS Industrial. And what that is, is it's an operating system that you can run robots off of that runs on Linux and allows you to tie multiple interesting sensors and simulation environments and all kinds of really neat open source things together to drive all types of different robots from little rover robots that are are like science project scale all the way up to insane industrial robots that achieve real work. So with that, I'm going to hand you guys off to the interview and we'll do a little recap at the end. All right, so I'm here at IMTS. This is Joe um, with uh, Matt Robinson of Southwest Research Institute. And uh, what do you do there? Hey, Joe. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I work at Southwest Research Institute down in San Antonio. Uh, it's a little nonprofit. It's been around since the mid '40s. Uh, working on a lot of applied engineering and trying to get stuff over the the valley of death when it comes to like tech transfer, right? So um, it's been a lot of fun. But what I do there is the idea of like leveraging open source robotic software, ROS, right? The robot operating system and applying it in industrial use cases, right? In a program we call ROS Industrial. And so um, what we're trying to do there is basically mature some of that capability and make it so people can actually use it in factories and do neat stuff with it. Very neat stuff. Uh, well, ideally. Yeah. The, <laughs> A little bit of background here. Uh, Matt and I uh, used to work together at our big yellow tractor jobs, yep. and um, we implemented open source robotics uh, in, in the research state and worked heavily on Ross Industrial to uh, not necessarily use in production, but get the understanding out there that it, this is useful and valuable yes. um, and sustainable. So. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point, Joe. Like, we, were, we were hoping to actually deploy novel capability where basically we can actually attack a lot of these high mix applications where it's like a boatload of part numbers. In the traditional automation world, you've got to have a specific program for that part number. Yeah. Heaven forbid an engineering change. I'm like, oh, did that impact my program? Yeah. And it's just like a bear on tax. So this idea where we could actually leverage, like, say, a Microsoft Connect back in the day yeah. and actually regenerate program paths just based on the camera data was a really compelling idea. Yeah. And the fact that it's open source was really exciting, too, because it gives us the opportunity to both learn a lot about really how the code works, the software works, and of this opportunity about contributing and being part of a bigger community. Yes. Right? That rising tide lifts all boats. Right. Yeah. And they... You know, this kind of applies on, on the maker world a little bit because you know our initial research. I did all of our programming on a Chromebook Pixel running Ubuntu, and um, we were using a, a standard you know first gen Xbox 360 Connect. So it wasn't anything special. It wasn't a crazy industrial sensor, and we were able to do an incredible amount of useful work with it. Um, it, when you think about it, when you compare it to like a thirty thousand dollar industrial sensor, correct. Um, and I think we implemented it in some ways much easier uh, because of the ROS tools that allowed us to. Yeah, I think you know when we talk about like say the average like say manufacturing technician, ROS is still kind of intimidating, and that's something we're oh, seeking yeah. to address. I mean, you mentioned Ubuntu. Yeah. Uh, I don't know about your audience, but sometimes in the traditional manufacturing world, they're a little put off. Like hear Linux, and they get a little nervous. Yeah. And they start hearing things like package and compiling C++ code, and all of a sudden, like, eyes gloss over, and it, it can be somewhat intimidating. The great news is, right, we are seeing interact, interoperability with, say, MATLAB, which was obviously appealing to a lot of our coworkers at Caterpillar. Yes. But obviously, a lot of really great work going on in Python, and now best practices for implementing Python nodes that play nice with C++ nodes. Right. All in this aim. And of course, now the evolution of actual GUIs. Yeah. Right now we have actual graphical interfaces where you can actually tune and do some turning knobs on ROS applications. Oh, that's so without, amazing. Without a graduate degree in CS. Yeah. So some of that, that's part of my charter. Right. That's why I left Caterpillar, where we wanted to do ROS stuff. But we realized there was this hurdle. Yeah, I love a Connect, and that's a great story. And one of my developers always says, you know, this has been great. I just need a decent computer and internet connection. I can download this stuff, and I'm, I'm doing something. But if we really want to like really make a big impact, we do have to address some of these challenges around demystifying Linux and, yeah. and making it more user-friendly. Yeah. So 
Um, we probably should have done this ahead of time, but like, can you give a high level explanation to what is ROS? Yes. Because I think that was like our first two years of just trying to figure out for ourselves what ROS was and explain to everyone who didn't even understand what Linux was, what ROS was to get us moving forward. So what is ROS and how could like an everyday user get into uh, maybe programming a small robotics project with it? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. So ROS is a robot operating system and it's supported by an outfit called Open Robotics. So around about 10 or so years ago, a startup came around called Willow Garage, and they were really interested in service robots. So they created a robot called, the, very famously, the PR2, personal robot number two. Right. Uh, and developed some really interesting videos, like uh, basically getting a beer out of the fridge and opening it and, and uh, folding laundry. Yeah. Uh, the video is always played at 10x, of course. Yeah. Great, as we like to say, all great robots are played at 10x or higher. <laughs> um, but anyways, out of that work they did in service robotics came this software framework called ROS. And basically, it's just a middleware that basically abstracts away, if you will, or like removes the nuance of in interacting with specific hardware. Yeah. So basically, I just have this, I have this, you know, generic sized application, and I'm moving some information around between nodes, and it's all publisher, subscriber, TCP, IP communication, and a node framework. And then I just have to have an actual driver to interact with my specific hardware. Yeah. So for the roboticist, it became a very useful way to mock up applications pretty quickly. Yes. And then like, oh yeah, I guess got to have that interface for that piece of hardware, and then the, they can sort of operate hardware agnostic, and that, that yeah. kind of made it less of a challenge. It, it, yeah, it became super useful because you know, if you needed some, if you needed something like an Xbox Connect, we, we would download the ROS Connect node, and then connect the node for our specific robot through our software and you know it was just a couple lines of code to make those some things talk IP addresses yeah and yeah and some IP down. addresses and you know once we got past that initial block of what is ROS it became very clear and very fun and quick to start programming in I think that's a good point and the other thing because now ROS is over 10 years old um, and again, is you can learn really? more about ROS.org. Wow. Um, you can go into YouTube and type in ROS tutorial. Yeah. Uh, there is a buttload. Sorry. No, that's so, fine. Uh, <laughs> there, but there's just a, a serious mountain of great tutorial content. Yes. A lot of it's interactive. Um, a lot of it's just death by YouTube, if you will. Um, so to get started, if you want to drive, like move around a uh, TurtleBot and Arviz, there's a boatload of that. I mean, if you need to get it installed, you want to do a virtual box on a Windows machine, you can do that. They even have pre-built virtual boxes. Yes, exactly. So, right. So there's a lot of resources out there for relatively novices to, to dip their toe, so to speak, and, and, and get familiar with ROS and at least drive around a virtual robot. Yeah. Yeah. And to give you guys some background on me, I, I'm a very mechanical guy, and I've programmed a lot of industrial robots, but my... You know, hardcore CS programming background is I can read your code, I can pretty much understand your code, and I can copy and paste it, but I can't necessarily write it all. And I was able to get two industrial level robots running relatively simply and um, you know, executing real projects and getting real results. So it's, it's definitely not, that's interesting. Somebody is very angry about somebody talking Security. on a cell phone. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's it, the barrier to entry is not uh, it's not what it seems. I, no, I right. I mean, obviously, once you get over, and you know, it's funny being here at IMTS, right? We, we've interacted with some of our OEM friends, we'll say, the industrial yeah. robot makers, and they're like, "Well, until this gets in the windows, it's just it's just not going anywhere." I mean, obviously, the good news is, yes, it is coming to Windows. Right? That's, that, that ship is coming. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I think that this intimidation of Linux is, like, much overblown, right? Like, we're to the point now where PCs being part of, of these robotic systems is commonplace. Yes. And no one really cares if it's a Windows box or a Linux box, right? No. I mean, it's invisible. It sits in a cabinet somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's been, I think, a lot of those barriers have, have come down. Yep, um, and that's been very exciting. And the advent now of like so many more sensors. It used to be the Kinect was the only game in town. Yeah. Um, now there's so many sensors. You, you really can do all kinds of neat things. And, and there's still a lot of options in like the starting at thirty dollar price point. Yeah. I mean, right. So it really is truly accessible to the maker, to yeah. the maker community, and that's exciting. Yeah. And if you guys want to play with like actual physical robots, there's a ton of ross based robot kits for like two hundred bucks to to build little rover robots yeah. that. 
leverage legitimate sensors and do you can do real things with them and get real experience. And Absolutely. I think that's really important because um, uh, is it like it used to be? Where you know, if you knew Ross and you wanted a job, you could pretty much just get a job. Yeah, I, I think you know, we, we uh, my group, we specifically look for Ross on the resume. Yeah, right. So, it, but and, and the experience can be, I did a Ross project and it was a little rover. Yeah, that doesn't matter. And, and like, it's not just Swery that's interested in that. GM's doing projects with Ross. Yep. Ford's doing projects with Ross. Tesla's doing projects BMW. with Ross. Yep. BMW. Um, so it's all your aerospace players. It's huge. Um, so one of the things we wanted to talk about, though, is um, open source in the workplace. Yeah, and that was a huge hurdle for us specifically. Initially. And then it, it became almost like everyone was excited that we were contributing back to this project. Right. Um, and you were saying something about an article you were reading. Yeah, so recently, and I, I, I wish I could quote you the author of that article, uh, <laughs> but it was going floating around on LinkedIn, a recent study, and I, I don't even, can't even think of the... I'll look it up and put it in show Harvard, notes. A Harvard Institute, I, I don't know. Anyways, we can we can track it down. You can yeah. drag it up later. But basically, there was an, a study done recently talking about uh, companies that actually contribute allow their employees to contribute to open source end up being more profitable and productive than if they did not allow them to contribute to open source, even if competitors leverage the open source contributions. And they found that what, they happen, what happens is, is that the, 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 the staff that actually are participating in the open source community, they become so much more productive through the interactions of the open source community, right? Yes. They're getting interaction, feedback, they're, they're developing better coding skills and, and how to modify their tools and the yeah. content they're creating. That, that they can't just get in their silo within their job, right? Because yeah. open source, it's a bigger tent. Yeah. The tent doesn't get any bigger. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how big your company is. Cat was a big company, but the open source tent's way bigger. Yeah. Right? And so that diversity of the feedback you get on your contributions, you can't match that. And, right, and that's what they were talking about as far as, like, the productivity improvements for, hey, this staff is just better. Plus, they're engaged, right? I know mm -hmm. our staff... They love interacting with the open source community. Like they yeah. want to brainstorm on like a total open source robot controller. Yeah, a total <laughs> unified control for a robot or a CNC. Yeah, yeah. Let's do that, right? So, and we're very excited uh, to enable that, and, and whenever we can to create not just pushes back, which still some for profit companies don't even allow you to make improvements, like say to PCL. Yeah. Sorry, Point Cloud Library. Yeah, it's it's a standard open source tool. If you find a bug, like contribute it back. Yeah. Right, but no, they'll like maintain their own PCL or like list of modules that they have to maintain on their own. I, yeah. I, I don't understand. But yeah, there's a real opportunity there. It's a real it's a real boon to organizations to enable this participation in open source. Yes. And, you know, a big thing that like I think we saw on our team was um, a lot of our contributions were things that we were developing on our own time because we loved working on the project. It wasn't because anybody would, had a gun to our head for deadlines. It was like, no, nah, I think I'm going to go home and I got this really cool idea for this sim. I think I'm going to try to work it out tonight. And it, it was just because I really enjoyed it and I was able to have that interaction um, with with a the developers, you know, I could email the guy that wrote the tool that I'm trying to implement and ask him questions about it. And the open source community is so sharing and you know, <laughs> open that um, you know, almost instantly I would get a, a feedback on the form. I I remember emailing back and forth with uh, I never said his name out loud because it was. Uh, I think he's German. It was like VD Horn. Uh, hi, yes. Um, and we were emailing back and forth about the Fanuc drivers, um, you know, all the time. And uh, we ended up developing a really good rapport just over email. And I was able to contribute a bunch of stuff back. That's and great. I loved that. I love those success stories, right? And we really try to foster that. We encourage our partners. You know, obviously the knock on the industrial side, as opposed to like say the community side, is that. There's a lot of taking, but not necessarily as much give back. Right? Yeah. So we're trying to do what we can. That's another mission on mine. Is like, what what can we do on the industrial side to foster contribution? I don't and I don't really care where it comes from. I mean, if if, if for profit team members like at Cat can can contribute, so be it. We don't we try not to give anyone a hard time if they can't. But you know, obviously we try to foster university like startups, like whatever we can do to incentivize contributing. Right. Um, I know 
the way we did is like obviously the Keyence driver from the CAT projects. Yeah. It was a great contribution. And uh, but we were able to leverage that as in-kind development. Yeah. That's a useful tool as well. Like those are those are levers we're willing to pull to incentivize. I had uh, someone out of the blue uh, contribute tutorial videos to um, our uh, QT Creator uh, tool set that we have for Ross. Um, I, I reached out to him like, why did you do this? He's like, I just love robotics. <laughs> I love QT Creator, so I created these tutorials. And I'm like, what's your address? And I shot him a shirt. Yeah. Right? So whatever we can do to kind of like encourage that continuous engagement, um, you know, we encourage all of our partners to get involved. I mean, it's the best way that everyone wins. Yeah. Right. So I'm glad you you found it to be a great experience. And I know, at like our company, the trick was, well, how do we enable like allowing I'm like, well, let's just submit something and then let's see what breaks. Yeah. <laughs> And that's actually the story at Southwest too, right? Yeah. Well, we weren't really sure if we were allowed, so we did it and then told them about it after. Yeah. Sometimes that's, <laughs> I'm not saying that's the official approach. No, but you know, it's it's better sometimes. So, sometimes being able to show the results of what you did right. is better than trying and to then, explain then, what the results could and be. And then they were able to be like, oh wait, the sky didn't fall in. Maybe this is all right. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and in our group, it, it, it counted. It was relatively well received, as long as we said like, ah, eh, it's just a basic building block. Yeah. And ideally, we want to like drive that understanding at other places too. Yeah. Well, cool. Um, I think that's all I've got. Uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, but uh, so this was Joe for Makers on Tap and uh, Matt Robinson with uh, Southwest Research Institute. So thanks, guys. I'll catch you guys on the next interview. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. All right, so that was Matt Robinson with Southwest Research Institute. Hope you guys enjoyed the interview. I really enjoyed doing it. I want to say thanks to Matt for taking the time to sit down and hang out with me for a little bit and share some of the work that he's been doing. Um, if you would like to be interviewed by Makers on Tap or if you know someone that you'd love to hear interviewed, we'd love to do it. I really enjoy doing these. Uh, we've got a couple more lined up to do in the near future. Um, but you know, with that... Uh, keep making stuff. Thanks, guys.